In 2013, I meet Clinton Young, who is on death row in Texas. I'm making a documentary on the death penalty and talk to him about his situation. But you've been here for a long time, right? Yeah, I've been here since 2003. I was 19 when I came to death row. I was 18 when I got the case, right? So and you're now? 30. 30. Yeah, I just turned 30 in July. It's kind of a depressing I milestone. I would have said congratulations, but it's yeah, not really. Just, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of a depressing milestone. I mean, have time. At one point, I didn't think I was gonna make it to 30. Mm -hmm. You know, and now that I made it, it's like, well, I've spent all my 20s on death row, so. Clinton has been convicted of murder. Being involved in gang culture, he refuses to talk to the police when he's arrested. He's also on parole from juvenile prison, where he had done some time for burglary. For Clinton, it goes without saying that you don't inform on others. But the other young three men arrested with him have no such qualms. They all claim that Clinton is the killer. And then JR comes from around the house and he gets kind of like real close to Doe's car by walking around and then that's when Clint Young shot him. And Clint walks over to the body and pulls it up the pillow, put it back over his head. I pulled the trigger again, and he ran around to the front of the car and got back in and told us to get in. After our talk, Clinton asks me in a letter to look at his case with an open mind. He says he is not the killer and claims his co-defendants made plea deals with the DA. When I look at his case, I immediately know something is seriously wrong. There are no fingerprints or DNA or any other evidence that Clinton committed the two murders. Only statements by his fellow suspects, Mark, Darnell, and David, which show substantial discrepancies. They realize all the stuff I have in my favor, and they don't want me to get it before the court because they don't want me to win. See, it's not about justice. It's about upholding the statistic. I'm going to need your vehicle. Pow, pow. OK. The past four years, I examined testimonies and gathered with health information such as crucial ballistic research. I also talked to involved parties and witnesses. I hope to get an answer to the question, could it really be that the wrong man is on death row? The guy getting in the vehicle. You still put your money on him, huh? It's still him. It's no excuse, but my defense is I didn't kill nobody. I didn't know nobody was going to die, and nobody was supposed to die. You know, we was going to go buy some blunts, marijuana cigars, you know, and then things took a turn. The guy got shot, and then at that point, I was worried about getting in trouble. David Page shot him outside the car, and then Mark Ray shot him later on. This is what happened. I don't have a fear from the truth. I read this statement. 
of my rights and I understand what my rights are at this time. I am willing to answer questions without a lawyer present. I've read that to you. You can reread it and I'm going to need your signature here uh, on that line. But I'd like you to reread it. Uh, can you read it out loud? Before we ask you any questions, you must understand your rights. You have the right to remain silent. Any Anything you say can be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer for advice before we ask you any questions. You have the right to have a lawyer with you during question. Where is everybody sitting in the car? Doyle's under the wheel, obviously. Doyle's on the wheel. And I was in the middle at the time, in the middle. And Mark was right here. And JR was on the other side, the left side of me, though, in the back seat. So, so this is the, the, the seats here. Darnell sh uh, should have seen what happened, right? So he, he well, must see, have he, seen. He lies about where he was sitting at. Yeah, he I said he was uh, in the, the middle. In he the middle. Not, he was not in the middle. He was mm -hmm. sitting directly behind me. Because I, right I turned like this and talked to him. Mm -hmm. Be the, because but, Mark Ray says he was there. He wasn't. Mark would, Ray, Mark Ray would, was in. I guess because he thinks I did it, so he don't want to be lined up right behind me in case I try no, to blame him. No, he said he was in the middle, so he can right, see right, the Right, right. I guess that's, that's the only thing I can think of, but he was not sitting in the middle of that car. I know so that for a fact. So what's the car seating? What do you think was the car seating? Oh, I remember the car seating. It was Duel, me, David Page, Mark Ray, and Darnell McCoy. Okay, so no one actually said that that was the car seating. So well, no, were, but that's what I'm saying. Four versions. Now. I mean, yeah, but I remember it like I can even tell you the song that was playing on the radio at the time it happened was uh, Superman by Three Doors Down. I mean, I, that's why I'm saying I remember, I have. I guess I got a better memory than them, right? When you get to the house, does everybody just stay sitting in the car? Yeah, it stayed seated for a while until JR went out there and went around the house. So JR gets out and he, why is he walking around the house? Do you know? He this was a buy. This was a buy. Well, we. All right, from this house, from this guy living in this house. So JR gets out and walks around the house, right? And so that leaves the, the three of y'all and Doyle sitting in the car. What happens then? And then JR comes from around the house and he gets kind of like real close to Doe's car by walking around and then that's when Clint Young shot him. And David Page was standing outside the car walking up to the car mm -hmm. when he shot him. David Page shot him? Yes, that's what I'm saying. The window was rolled down and things like that. And when he hit him, your natural reflex is dual set back up yeah. and fell forward. And that's when Page shot him in the back of the head. And then I jumped out the car. So what you're saying is that JR is somewhere outside this car over here? Where was JR standing when Clint? He was standing right in front, right in front by the door. And he's standing there when Clint. Any conversation, I mean, you're sitting right, off right behind him. What, what conversation is going on in the car right before and during the time that, that Clint sh shoots Doyle? What happened? Okay, before he was sitting like at a, Clint was sitting at like at a slant way like this. Mm -hmm. And he had the, the gun up under him like this. And when he was going to, sh when he was going to shoot him, Doyle was paying attention to to uh, JR, and JR reached and opened up the door. As soon as JR reached and opened up the door, Clint went and shot him. Okay, so what, did Clint say anything when he did it? He says, sorry, Doyle, and then just shot him. He said, sorry, Doyle, and then shot him? Okay. And can, can you remember how you felt when the first shots were fired? It was like, I don't know, I mean, I can't really describe it, you know what I'm saying? It was like, I, I just remember thinking, you know, damn, we're all in some shit now, you know? And I don't know if it's because of coming from TYC and being in such an extremely violent environment that it actually, I mean, in some ways, numbed me to the violence. Mm -hmm. I mean. But it's different when someone right before your eyes gets shot, shot in the head, right? Well, I mean, I wasn't looking, so I mean, it was like I heard it. I was looking out the car like this, and I heard the gunshots. So then what happened? And then Clint got out. Uh, JR was already out, and Mark ran out. And 
JR and Clint picked them up and put them in. Who opened the trunk? Uh, Clint opened the trunk. And I heard the gunshots, and I looked, and I jumped out. At first, I didn't snap what had happened. I didn't know what to do with shoot, because I'm, keep in mind, I'm sitting right beside the door, and this dude's shooting into the car. So I started cussing David Page out, because I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't snap until I looked back down, and then door, and I was like, man, fuck. Victim was here, that's for sure. Clinton was here, that's for sure too. The guys in the back, three of them, they all have different stories. But they said that that Clinton, who was sitting here, shot the guy over here. But the bullet, the bullets were on the left of his head. How can that be? Is it possible? From there? Not unless he was facing this way. Turn, like this. Turn this way, right. No, they actually, all of them, uh, uh, their testimonials say that he was using his left hand to put the passenger seat down to have someone else uh, step in. So he was doing like this. Well, the passenger in the front could not have shot him. Because it's not possible. Because yes. Clinton, who's, who's um, on death row for this, said that the guy was outside and shot him twice. Could that be? Yes. And how uh, how likely is it? Because the two co-defendants who uh, did a lot of less time, they said that Clinton was sitting here, pulled his gun from his waistband and shot him twice in the head. How how likely is that? From no. that, is it possible? Not just pulling and shooting. No. Can you show me how that would? It had to do this number right here. And if you shot from right here, yeah. There's no way. Wh where would you hit me if I do this? Probably wouldn't even hit you. Because? It'll probably miss you because you're not aiming. On this distance, you can still distance. miss? Yes. If you just pull out your and, and do it like this, yeah. you can miss this person. Trying to shoot the head, the body you could hit. The head is harder to hit. Mm -hmm. Because it's moving, right? But if, if, if he was, yes, if he got shot in the head twice mm -hmm. and kind of close, the bullet holes were kind of close, there's no way he could have just pulled it out and, and shot like that. Because that's what they said. He pulled it out of his waistband, kept it there, and shot him from that point in, on this side of the head. Was he a, uh, an expert shooter? No, he was 18, no. Okay, there's no way he could have shot like that and hit the person twice in the head. Because you have to be an expert? You'd have to do a lot of training. And at 18 years old, there's no way he could have done it. There's no possible way. Because bullets do not shoot around a corner. The shots were rapid fire. So, I mean, I remember he was he was leaning forward like that. So when, and I remember when the shot happened, because I, of course I naturally turned like that, and he fell back, he flew back like this in the seat. And then he fell back forward, right? Once I, I looked and I seen that happen, I turned and grabbed the car and I jumped out and I pulled my pistol out and I pointed at Paige. And then I was like, you know, what the fuck, man? I mean, just the fact of the way his head was facing. I would have had to get the gun, lean into the back seat like that, yeah, around and then his shoot. Head. Right, and that's why, I mean, the angle's just not plausible. Are you saying that Clint Young was the only one that had a gun with him? Had guns with him. Did you know that he had guns with him when he left North City? At the time, no. Okay. When when did you find out that he had guns with him, or that y'all there were guns in the car? When after he murdered uh, Doug Douglas. My favorite picture of him. This is um, this is probably one. That one. And how how old is he here? Uh, probably first grade. Yeah, first grade. And there's the one in the suit that's my favorite. <laughs> he was like three, this four. This one? Yep. Oh, that's really, that's really. That's probably cute. my favorite, favorite. <laughs> what was he all dressed up for? 
just for go get a picture taken. <laughs> yeah, he's yeah. he still has the same smile. He does have the same smile. This was his room. I mean, it's totally different now, but different bed and everything. But that was his room. That same picture hung up there in the same place. It's yeah. always been there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you do you come here often? Yeah, my mother-in-law painted that, and um, I just kind of always thought it reminded me of him, sitting on a rock fishing. <laughs> so I left it. How is it for you to visit him? Uh, can't wait to get there and hate to leave. It's real emotional. Again, this every time, you know. Every day, you know he's living in a, a box. He's my baby. <laughs> would sit in that prison for him to get him to come home. I just remember it being so typical, like the the older brother, little sister. I mean, we, you know, I remember playing together. I remember, um, you know, skating and riding bikes and um, going in the woods and building forts. And um, I also remember, you know, me locking him out of the house and us fighting and playing. Um, Baseball. He was good to me, you know, he helped me with things. Um, we played together. Um, he also, you know, picked at me. Of course, like any brother and sister does, did stuff that would, you know, I don't know, chasing me around the yard with a garden snake. You know, the typical brother, sister, picking on each other things. He was, he was a good brother, or he is a good brother. so that way he'll probably either drown, or if he don't die from the bullets, he'll either drown at first. Mm -hmm. And then he asked Mark Ray to shoot him. Mm -hmm. And Mark Ray had the 22. And Mark Ray shot him in the back of the head. Okay, this is gonna be video of the scene where the body was found with us. Is Mark Ray, before you tell us what happened out here, I want to read you your rights. You have the right to remain silent, not make any statement at all, and any statement you make may be used against you at your trial. Any statement you make may be used as evidence against you in court. You have the right to have a lawyer present to advise you either prior to any question or during any question. If you've been able to employ a lawyer, you have the right to have a lawyer appointed to advise you prior to or during any question. You have the right to terminate this video interview at any time. You understand these right? Yes, sir, I do. Okay, so you're going to voluntarily then tell us what happened out here, where everybody was, and yes, in regards to that. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. This is the little road 
where the body was found. You drag it over like this, and I'm throwing, I'll grab a hold of the angle again, and I drag it over this part. And Clint told us to step back. So we stepped back, and he, Clint walked up to the trunk and found the suitcase, and we thought he was looking at us to make sure we weren't going to run nowhere. And he put the suitcase back down and walked to the driver's side of the car, part of the car, and grabbed the pillow. And we kept, you know, we just stepped back and Clint walked over to the body and folded up the pillow and put it back over his head and pulled the trigger again. And he ran around to the front of the car and got back in and told us to get in. So JR got back in the front. How many times did he pull the trigger? He pulled the trigger once again. Okay, so the body, how's the body laying? The body was laying like long ways. Okay, face up, face down it on the was, side, it was face down. He told us to lay it face down. Okay. So that's the way we had it. And he folded up the pillow and he pulled the trigger. And when we were driving up, he told me and Van A and them that if we said anything to anybody, that he'd kill us and our families. Patrick Brooks testified about how Mark Ray pulled out the gun and bragged about how he kicked Doyle into the creek and shot him. So they all that crying they did in the videos and all that crying they did on the stand, they wasn't crying when they were shooting people in the head. But initially it was all on me. I mean, I don't know what they talked about in the back of the car or anything like that or when I was away from them or I don't know. But um, I wasn't driving around threatening them because they all had loaded guns, you know what I'm saying? Were any of you armed? Clint was armed, uh, Mark Ray was armed, and uh, JR. What were they armed with? Two 22s and a 38. Who had what? Do you remember? Uh, Clint had the, a 22. Describe it. It was chrome with a long nose on it. And it was 22 caliber? You're sure of that? And uh, they had another one like a revolver. It was a 22 short. Who black. had it? And the 38. Who, was, who had the 22? The short black 22. The short black 22, Mark Ray. And then there was another gun you said. Who had it? The 38 was, was in possession of. of uh, it was in possession of me. I had. You had it. What happened? He dropped the mark off first. Where did he drop Mark off at? He dropped Mark off at his house. And he dropped me off right there on the top of the hill. Yeah. Because he didn't take me straight to my house because he knew that JR was gonna ride off with him and leave with him. Okay. So JR didn't want his dad to see him and Clint in that car together. Did they talk about what they were gonna do after? They dropped y'all off, where they were going, what their plans were. They talked about, he talked about that he wasn't finished yet and he was still had to do, he had what, something else. What did you take that to mean when he said, I wasn't finished, I'm not finished yet. He wasn't finished yet. That he was going to kill somebody else, do something to him. time I'm thinking, I really wasn't thinking a whole bunch. That was a problem, really, actually, right? I mean, I had been up for days. I was high on methamphetamine. I wasn't in the clearest state of mind. And at that point, I just wanted to get away from everything. And that's why I left East Texas. That, that's what I don't get, why you don't just get away from these guys. But you stayed with them. Well, the one of, well, I stayed with one. I asked myself why, I mean, the same question, you know, why I didn't have him just turn around or whatever, right? I know that any normal person would have said, hey, I'm gonna call the police, you know? But I didn't have a normal life, you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not trying to really blame it on my life so much, but it conditions you to certain things, 
you know, it's the way you respond to critical situations. I just wanted to go to sleep, Jessica. That's all I wanted to do. And that's what I did. I went to sleep. I had just got gas at this little substation, little sub, like they have a um, gas pump in the parking lot. This and was I, in Doyle's car, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And I drove up and I got out and went inside Brookshire's mm -hmm. and I got the Sprite, the sunflower seeds, and the buy one, get one free pack of Marlboro Mild cigarettes. Well, I come out and that's when Paige was already in the truck. Mm -hmm. In the truck with Paige? Right? Yes, yes, sir. And so when I seen the situation, I recognized it was something what was, what was the situation? He was just well. He was sitting there. in a truck. He wasn't supposed to be sitting in. So something ain't right. And Pe Petri was there. Or? Yeah, Petri was sitting in the passenger seat. And so I look over there and I'm like, man, what's up? And he said we need. He said we need a new vehicle. And so uh, I was like, man, come on. And I hopped in the car and took off. Right. By the time I'm to the second murder, I went to sleep. And the gunshots woke me up. I jumped out of the truck, and I seen there was only one person standing there, David Page. Well, I asked him why he shoot him, and he said he knew my name. He knew Page's name. Right, right. And when Samuel Petrie is shot, that took a toll on me. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, man, this dude's done told me about having family. I mean, this is the type of man that I was raised to respect. And so now he's sitting there, he's shot, and I get into an argument with my co-defendant. Who was that? David Page. Mm -hmm. It was like, this dude was not supposed to die, okay? He's not somebody that did anything or harmed anybody in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, and then reality setting in, everything's gonna come back on me too. So self-preservation self-preservation kicks in. Mm -hmm. I mean, people say, why didn't you call the police? Well, that wasn't an option. I mean, that, I mean, that wasn't what I considered an option. Because you were on parole? Well, on, on parole and just to the fact that the people that I had been hanging around with since I was 13, 14 years old, it was always preached, you don't inform the police, you know? It's not so much of not wanting to go to the police because I, I was like, you know, this is an innocent person. You know, this isn't a gang member. This isn't a dude that's involved in a drug trade. This is a man that was going to a store to get some food for his family. Okay, he wasn't looking for trouble. And so he goes, and this, this happens to him. And the shock of everything's kicking in. So all I'm thinking about at that point in time is self-preservation, is getting away from everything. Because I don't want to go back to jail. So I said, look, I don't give a fuck what you do, man. Just get away from me. Yeah. And then he got out the truck. And did he tell you, I'm going to turn myself in? Or he yeah, just did, yeah. He did. But I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't thinking like, that he okay, was actually going to do put it. it all on me, right? No. And then so I was like, okay, I don't care what you do. Just get away from me. And I was wondering, what are the odds that that David Page will tell what happened? I don't, it ain't, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's between him and whatever God he's choosing to worship right now, you know? <laughs> Good morning or afternoon, how are you? Hi, my name is Jessica, good to see you. Have a seat. So he dropped you off, right? He dropped me off at IHOP. At IHOP. But 
how much sense does that make if he if he held you at gunpoint or he didn't he hold you at gunpoint right he just you oh, felt uh, afraid because he was carrying a gun do i understand that correctly right. it's just like anything you, you try to you try to get away with get away with something like i said if I, if I had a gun and i'm holding you right or even if i'm not holding you, you're just riding along with me and you know i've done killed two people you're going to try and talk your way out of getting away from me whether or not we're, we're cool or not you're going to try and get away some some way form or fashion and it took me that long to figure out, okay, cool. I'm, that's the way I'm going to be able to do this. I'm going to be able to manipulate him letting me go by telling him to get, a, get away from here. So you so, outsmarted him. In my opinion, yes. the worst was the police chase because they say why are you running if you're not if you're not guilty but I did not know I was wanted for murder I'm on parole there's a gun in the truck I'm going back to jail I'm outside of the city limits of where I'm supposed to be I'm going back to jail and I got caught on the interstate at work and a friend of mine heard it on the news and called me and told me at work. They knew it was Clint? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they, they, they called they had us to come and get me because I couldn't drive. Yep. And uh I remember my mom crying, the phone ringing, the news on. I just remember chaos. I don't remember exactly, you know, word for word, obviously, but I just remember it saying murder, you know? Like, I just, I remember his mugshot on there more than anything. Like, I can just, I can see it in my mind right now. Like, I talked to him that night on the phone. I believe he called me collect. Or I, and I talked to him that night. He's like, Christy, I swear to you, I didn't do this. And I was like, I believe you. You know, no matter what, I believe you. And you still do? Yeah, I do. I do. And they all changed their story to benefits, whatever they but were But no saying. one ever asked you how the car seating was? No. Well, I refused to talk to the police about it. You know, I refused, when I, when I was first arrested, I refused to talk to the police, period. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I know how it is. It's a serious charge, and I've done been involved in the cops, and I know how they do things. <laughs> I'm not talking to y'all without an attorney. And, um, but why didn't you, if you don't have because, any name? Because, you know, like I said, I, I was caught up in this street cultural mindset where you don't talk to the police. You know, you don't inform on other people, right? But what if you know that it can It'll save be, you? I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, you know what I'm saying? I mean, if it was like a child or something like that, and somebody's hurting a child, then that's that's different, you know? I mean, it's just, I'm 31 years old now, so I see the nonsense in these quote-unquote rules that all these drug dealers and stuff and gamers and stuff that everybody lives by. I'm not saying it's right, but it's what I adhered to at the time, and at the time, it was, to me, I'm not telling the police nothing. And so I didn't know that they was putting it on me. I'm not gonna get these people in trouble to get myself out of trouble. That was my whole position, right? So I was like, man, I ain't got nothing to say against them. Now, had I known that they was all giving statements against me already, then I would have said, hold them up, you know? But at the same time, I'm doing this, my mom, I'm telling my mom, go find Darnell so he can help me. And my mom was like, baby, I think he's the one that first told the police. I was like, what? And I read his statement. I don't know, I mean, I don't know where it came from or why it happened that way, but I mean, that's, that's his story. Anything that, that uh, you want to clear up here today? You remember anything? So I can remember that. That's that stuff. Uh... <laughs>
Why didn't you ever took the stand to tell your part of the story? Uh, it's not because I didn't want to testify. I wanted to testify. You did, but right. your lawyers advised yes, you. Yes, my lawyers. It was a, a big deal. We went round and round and round about it. For I all wanted the other to take stuff. the stand. Yeah. I mean, there was even a media report about the reporter overhearing me and my lawyers arguing. It wasn't because I didn't want to. It was because I was 18 years old, 19 years old at the time, and I talked with a lot more street slang than I do now. Mm, so that's the biggest regret. Right. Yeah. Yes, it was because I never got my side of the story, and it would have cleared things up. Yeah. You know, because like some things didn't make sense, and there was holes in the stories where the DA was making it more than what it should have been. I mean, I could have just cleared the whole picture up and explained, you know, because the jury was left with the belief that two people was killed for their cars. I heard that JR did go with uh, did go with Clint to Midland, Odessa. Yeah, I don't I don't know where Nana went off to. Okay, this will conclude the video. It's 328 on the 27th of November 2001. They convicted me. I was devastated. What, I mean, what I, happens? I, what happens? Because I can I just imagine went numb. Just... I mean, I, 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 it was like I went numb. I couldn't. I had no comprehension of of time and space, basically, right? Because I was like, like I almost fainted, and I started. I had tears coming out of my eyes and stuff. And my attorneys were like, they took it real hard. <laughs> and then the sheriff of the county, the top police officer, he grabbed me from behind and started trying to wrestle me, which was totally uncalled for. He just did it in front of the jury to put on a show. So that devastated me. I was like, because my life's over with. And then my mom, when they gave me the death sentence, she collapsed and was crying and screaming. And I tried to like, they was walking me out of the courtroom and I tried to reach to grab her hand. And they was having, the lawyer secretary was having to hold my mom back. And the bailiffs grabbed me and pushed me into the other room, right? So that kind of image is still stuck in my mind. And I would, ask if I can hug him or touch him or, you know. And could you? A couple times he actually let me. And when was the last time you held your son? The day before they found him guilty. I was not allowed to touch him. He was a good brother. He was always trying to, you know, hang out and do what I did and be there. And I was the older sister aggravated and, you know, it's kind of like, no, no, no. <laughs> My dad was always working. And when he'd come home, you know, he'd start drinking and it wasn't really like, you know, a family. I don't really remember a connection between the two um, or them sitting around doing something together or anything like that. And if he had a bad day, you know, everybody knew it. And what would the situation be like then when he had a bad day? Um, just being 
I guess, m mean. Um, he would take it out on my brothers in particular. And his dad was abusive verbally, physically, mentally. So how long did you end up staying with him in the end? Not long. Uh, Clint, let, uh, Clint was probably, I guess he was about 18 months old. Give her the kitty. You know, I wish when I found out I was pregnant, I'd walked away. He never would have known him, ever. You know, I, if I should have, could have wooded it to death. You know, I would have walked and done it by myself before I would have ever let him lay eyes on him or know that he was even alive. But Clint wanted that relationship with his dad and he wanted to keep going back and he wanted the, the relationship with his brothers and sisters. And, um, He's a lot like me in that aspect of wanting the family to stay together. And he tried and tried and tried. He wanted so bad um, for him to love him and and have that bond with him and it just it just didn't happen. It just wasn't there. I'm the only one in like 30 years that they gave the death penalty to. But I'll say that the way the law was written, I didn't have it in my mind that I would be walking out of that courtroom a totally free person. But I'm thinking 10, 15, 20 years here. Which is also a lot. Yes, yeah, a lot, but not in Texas standards because Texas hands out life sentences like it's candy. These are the two options that could have happened. Yes. I'm gonna need your vehicle. Pow, pow. Okay. And where do I fall from that? From here, you would fall this way. That okay, way. so that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, sir. Okay, no. the other one is, if I'm getting in the vehicle and you're turning to do whatever you gotta do I to the seat. I this, yes. He gets over right here, pow, pow. So that's what happened. And what's gonna happen, you're gonna fall this way. Like this. Yep. And this is what happened. This is what they said. I'm not sure if, if I'm he... getting in the vehicle. Pow, pow. I need your vehicle. Pow, pow. And then I... I'm not sure if he fell like this or like this, but he fell... He fell towards the steering wheel. Toward the steering wheel. Yeah. So is this guy right here getting in? This was him. This guy getting in It's right the here. only option. Yeah. If he fell forward, this guy right here shot him. Pow, pow. He went and forward. He was getting in the vehicle. Yes. That's the only way, if this guy was leaning forward on the steering wheel, he was getting in the vehicle and got shot from inside the vehicle. And that's what they all say, that he was getting in the vehicle when the shots were fired. Then but he they said, it. Yeah, but they said he did it. And he said, I didn't see it because I was just getting in the vehicle. Because he's the one that done it. This guy was the one that done it, getting in the vehicle. Only option. That's the only person that could have shot him. They just, they ramrodded that guy. It's the guy getting in the vehicle was the one that, that uh, shot him. That's David Page. That's the only one that could have done. It. 
I'm an attorney. I'm licensed in the state of Texas. And I am helping Clinton with some investigative work on his case. I am not part of his legal team. Um, he's got great attorneys in Los Angeles that are, that are working on his case. Um, I, I sort of pick up the slack where it's needed, um, and that's primarily doing investigative work. To me, it's very typical the way his case played out. So he had a court-appointed attorney at his um, initial trial um, that did not do a great job. He had a horrible post-conviction attorney um, that, uh, in my opinion, did a horrible job. Um, and who hired a mitigation specialist that was just abhorrent, um, did a terrible job. So I think there was injustice all the way through his case. Um, and I think it's, it's disgusting. I think it's, it's sad. Can you explain how all of you knew each other in the car? So Darnell, Mark, well, Clint. I've known, I've known Mark since I was seven, eight years old. Went to school together. Went to the same church Childhood together. Childhood friends, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Darnell was my cousin's husband. Uh, Clint, he, me and him dated the same, uh, same girl at one time. Not at the same time, but. Uh, and what did you think of Clint at the time you were all in the car? Did you like him or did you dislike him? Was there well, any? It's, before he, he shot the door, I'm like, right. Afterwards, I'm like, okay, what's the deal? Why, why did you do this? I'm still trying to rationalize why he did it. Mm -hmm. And what's your answer to that? What do you think? I've learned long ago, don't try to rationalize what other people do. So talking about the Doyle Douglas case, what what happened? Well, it I don't know about the rest of them, but I know whenever we started out, we went and got a ride from Doyle. We'd gotten a ride from Doyle plenty of times. Uh, he's the type of person you can give him drugs, and you can borrow his car. He doesn't care. You did that before. We've done that plenty of times before. So whenever we get to Longview to get some some weed, I get back in the car. As I'm getting back in the car, Clint shoots Doyle in the head twice. Whoa, that goes very fast. So what happened in between? Well, we were just riding to Longview. It's, but it's, we get out there, I get, go knock on the door, nobody answers. I knock on the back door, nobody answers. As I'm getting in, I don't know if you know what, uh, I think it was a Pontiac Grand Prix or Grand Am, two-door car. If, if you're sitting in the driver's seat, someone else is sitting in the passenger seat, and you have to lean your seat forward yeah. for, for the person to get in the back seat. Oh, well, while you're like this, two shots to the back of the head. Where were these bullets placed in the head? Well, Clint was sitting in the passenger seat. So he had turned sideways, fired. But in your first statement, you said the bullets were on the right of his head, right? I, that's why I would get, because it, it was like this. One's probably going to hit him here. The other one probably hit him there. I don't, I don't know exactly where they hit him. I just know they hit him somewhere in that journal vicinity. Yeah, they hit him in the left. They, I, they couldn't have hit him on the left. That's, that's in the papers. Couldn't have. Had him in the left. Couldn't have. I'm pretty sure. There's so much that wasn't revealed in my trial because my lawyer is focused on mitigation, mitigation. Because there's this belief that we get you a life sentence, we win. Because it's so hard to be the prosecutor in Texas. And, but, um, you know, of course I was like, well, hey, to hell with all that. I want to focus on all this guilt, innocent stuff here. And I was like, well, look, if they convict me of this, they're going to kill me. So, I mean, But it's only, it's only based on hearsay, right? Because they don't have any ballistics or forensics to, uh, well, to support their story. And that's the, that's the problem is because, well, on the, on the second murder, mm -hmm. it's my word against David Page's. They can't convict me based on page, David Page's statement. Mm -hmm. That's why the forensics are so important, because they have nothing. All they have is co-defendant testimony. There's no DNA, there's no fingerprints. I mean, you got two vehicles and like four guns, there's not one fingerprint for me. First, you stated that Clint took the final shots, right? No. 
In your first statement? Oh, yeah, in the first yes. statement, yes, ma'am. Why did you do that? I was trying to save Mark. I got told to... Because uh, you were friends. Right. I've known Mark a lot longer than I've known Clint. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like I told the investigators, first two investigators, uh, mm -hmm. I was trying to save Mark. And afterwards, you thought, no, I'm just going to... I was like, why, why, why not just bring out the truth? Can I ask you a very, very honest question? And I hope you're not offended, but this is my common sense again speaking. So I'm not attacking you, and I'm not judging, because I wasn't there. This is what I think. I think it's really hard to believe that someone lies in court to protect his friend and will not lie to protect his own life. Do you know? Do you I never understand? lied in court to protect my friend. You said. That okay, was a statement. It was giving... your statement, but it was really, really important. It was your first statement. You said Clinton shot this guy. He did. He killed him, you said. Mm. I, f I figured, like I told you again, I figured you shoot someone in the head, you think they're going to die. But what, what assures me that you're not uh, saving your own life right now? What assures me that you're telling the truth? Well, the only people that know the truth is me and Clint on the second murder. The first murder, the only people that know the truth is me, Clint, and Mark, and Darnell. And Darnell. Do you, do you want the truth to come out? Truth is out. Well, everyone says something different, so... One of you is telling the truth, yeah. And you say it to you. You know, I really think, um, again, this was just based on what I know, but I really think going back to his original trial, I, I, it was a turning point. I, I think then things should have gone differently. Um, I think he got screwed by the system. There's a nine mil. There's a nine mil. <laughs> I wonder if that's why he stands in line. Okay, so all the co-defendants say um, that Clint Clinton shot him with a, a 22 automatic, but the bullets in the head were actually from um, a Colt Huntsman 22. Is there any difference? Not really on a, when it comes to a 22 semi-auto. Some 22s are short, some of them have longer barrels. That's the only difference? That's the only difference. Okay, well, the bullets found in the head were from the Colt Huntsman 22. Do you have it? No, but I have a 22 that would do the same thing. It's small, it just has a short barrel. Mm -hmm. If you got it right here, it's perfect to fit right there. Yeah, okay, they say that he used this gun, so a bigger one than that one. And if he's sitting down and got that gun in his pants right there in the front, he's not too comfortable because that's a long barrel. I wouldn't even have that in the front of my pants and sitting down, this I would. That other gun, no, because the other gun's got a barrel on it probably about this much longer. Okay, so that's another thing to doubt. Yeah, no, 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 he wouldn't be sitting with it, unless the gun's sitting across ways, but not just down this where you can grab it like that, because that would be way too uncomfortable. I don't think, you know, the other guy did it. Here we go. I think it's loaded. And it looks almost like that Colt they said was fired. It's pretty much, you know, Long barrel, angled, that's similar to it. And if you put that in your pants, no. It would have to be here, and then you'd be digging in your pants to get it out. So it's not easy while sitting and... Oh, no. I wouldn't even sit with that in front of my pants. No, there, there's, he didn't have this gun on him. You know what? 
So this is actually where the first bullet came in, and this is the second one. So this How did is they determine that? Because they, they, these come from the same gun. Okay. And the third wound was on his right temple, and it came from a different gun. And, and this also matches up with what they say happened at the creek when the guy was face down. So these were, there were only two shots fired with one gun and one shot fired with the other. So this could be the only scenario. Yeah, and he was facing a little bit towards the windshield. Just a little, yes, this is what they all state. Yes, something like that. I, I guess that's what in the, what's in the statements. Mm. <laughs> okay, here we go. He just pulls it out, has it in his lap. No way. Where did you hit it? I didn't. You did? Can we try again? What if, okay. Crazy. Hold on. And can we remove can the you dog? Said, <laughs> you said it's a two-door car, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so he may have been leaning forward. Yeah, he was, actually. So you would need to be, like, back here a okay. little bit. Yeah, so, right, yeah. So you would need to be a little bit. Yeah, it's uncomfortable anyway. All right, we ready? Yes, but the dog is still there. She'll be out. I'm, it's going that up way anyway. Like this here. No. Did you hit it? In the shoulder. In the shoulder. And one of the co-defendants said um, he was actually aiming f uh, from 20 centimeters off. Then you can hit him in the left? No. With your left hand then? Yeah. Then you should have to... You would have to reach around like this. Where this guy is, oh, here, hold the gun, shoot him. Can you, well, maybe you can go that side without. Well, you'd have to lean back. Yeah. And then those two guys back here are going to yes. say, what are you doing? Yes. And they didn't say that. That the didn't guy happen. right there getting in. You still think that, right? The guy getting in shot him. Only option, yeah. you think. That's it. The guy was halfway getting in the vehicle when he shot him. But why would a jury believe this if it seems so clear to us? Prosecutor. If the prosecutor has a, a good story, he can get the people to, to believe it. Now, the defendant, his attorney's got to be real good to counteract that. Apparently, he didn't have a good attorney. No, he didn't, no. So that's, that's, if you don't have a good attorney, most of the time you lose anyway. But yeah, after doing this scenario, I put my life on it. The guy getting in the vehicle shot, shot the driver. Clint fired the first two shots. Because I was sitting right behind Doyle. I was getting Where were you car. sitting? Cars, back seat, there was uh, Mark Ray, Darnell McCoy, myself. Clint was sitting in the front seat, front passenger seat, and Doyle was driving. And how, how did the body fell when he was shot? Do you remember? Slumped over. Over to the towards steering the, wheel? Well, towards the steering wheel and the side of the car. Do you have any idea why Clint would shoot him? I found out on the way to Midland that uh, 
it was because he needed the car to go see his girlfriend. Ember. Right. And did he tell you about that, or he didn't say nothing about it? He didn't say nothing until after we started going to Midland. OK. After the shooting, and you told Clint, what, what the fuck are you doing, I can yeah. imagine, and what happened? He's just like, man, which, yeah, help me get him in the trunk, help me get him in the trunk. Was, was Doyle dead? He was moaning. He was moaning? Yeah, he was still moaning. He wasn't moving, but he was moaning. And what did you do? Well, Clint had a gun. I had no gun. I helped put him in the trunk, I ain't gonna lie. You had no gun? No, oh, man. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting in the car, and I'm just sitting there. With the body in the yes, trunk? Yes, ma'am. I'm just, I'm like debating. I'm like, eh, what do I do? And what were your options? Well, I could have went and, now that I think back on it, I could have went and, hey, hey look, man. Easily. Did. That's what I think. I would have right, gone. But I, I just seen this guy kill one person. And he could easily say, hey, OK, yeah, go, go take care of these people. Uh, he just snitched on me. The cops are after us. I was thinking of my family. Did he ever threaten to kill you, or? He never threatened to kill me, but he, he did tell me, hey, look, you know what it is if you tell on me. Mm -hmm. and that's the, I thought of my family. But you don't uh, seem very um, scared <laughs> uh, to me. I, I think you, but maybe it's a judgment. You don't seem like someone who's afraid. It's, I've, I've had guns pulled on me. I, I, I had a theory and I, I used to, married women, those are my favorite women to mess with whenever I was in the world. What? Married women were my favorite women to try and get with mm -hmm. whenever I was in the world. I've had guns pulled on me. I've, been beat up. I've been threatened with knives and stuff like that. So really, but it's so. If I, if I get shot, I get shot. If I die, I die. I wasn't worried really about myself. I was worried about my family. But he didn't say anything about your family, or did he? Yes, he did. He did. What well, did he, he, he didn't. Well, the way I, I can't say he came out and said, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hurt somebody in your family." But the way I took it was, you know what it is. If yeah. And in the meantime, this, this uh, victim is moaning in the trunk. So didn't you feel like, I need to help this guy? Because he might survive, or we need to get him some help? Or that's just my common sense. I thought about it, but then again, I'm like, OK, this dude's done my shot in the head twice. By the time we get, if I call, get a hold of the cops and everything, they send an ambulance out there. The dude's probably gonna be dead anyway. For one of the first laws in in, in life, self-preservation. Okay, I'm not gonna do something to put myself in jeopardy, much less my family. And and once again, I'm not judging, um, but can you imagine to me that it sounds so unnatural that someone's in your trunk crying for help and that you think, mm, no, I'm not going to do anything. What, what am I going to do to save him by myself other than contact the authorities? But you didn't do that either. That's the way I looked at it, dude was already dead. Were you ever sitting in the car thinking, I, could, I can call 911 or I can just inform someone? Well, or... see, that's why I had said something, actually. I did say something about the hospital. I said, look, man, we could just drop him off outside the mercy room and take off. Then somebody else, the person that didn't even shoot him, just happened to blurt out, oh, but they got cameras outside the hospital. And then so that kind of like nixed that idea. And they took him out there to the creek, and they laid him out there at the creek. And then um, the other code defendant shot him, right? This guy's face down in a creek. So the He's body was it. already yeah. face down? Yeah, we pulled him, pulled him out the trunk. Was he alive? Still. He was still, still alive? Still moaning. So I don't know if it was just the air left in the lungs and whenever we pulled him out, it, or if he was. But even if he was still alive and you lay him face down in the creek, he's going to drown. That's, as a lot of people say, that's common sense. Why the, the last two shots were unnecessary, in my opinion. But who shot them? Mark. Mark did. Why? Clint told him, here, go ahead and go ahead and put him out of his misery. And he did. Or you'll be laying down there with him. So, so he threatened Mark. Yes, ma'am. 
So he grabbed a pillow, stuck the gun in the pillow. Who grabbed a pillow? Uh, either Darnell or Mark. I can't remember exactly which one. But I know there was a pillow because he fired the shots into the pillow. So they put the pillow on the head? Yes, ma'am. On the back of his head? I believe so. And then they shot him? Marked it? Yes, ma'am. With what gun? A uh, twenty-two revolver. Clint's gun? He got, like I said, all three of them had guns. And you were the only one who didn't have a yes, gun? Yes, ma'am. But if all three have a gun, why would they go to the creek? Because Clinton says so. If they all have a gun. You would have to ask them. Doesn't make any sense to me. It'd be different. If, if, if I would have had a gun, I probably would have shot Clint. Mm. That's just me. You're threatening me? OK. Self-preservation. If I would have had a gun, I would have shot Clint. Man, that, that made me a hero. If Mark would have shot him, that would have made him a hero. Darnell would have shot him and made him a hero. He done shot somebody. But tell me how it works when Mark has a gun, Clint, I'm just trying to understand. Maybe I'm just missing something. Clint has a gun. He says to Mark, shoot him, or otherwise you'll be laying with him. Why didn't Mark shoot Clint? You have to ask Mark that. But what do you think? I don't, tr like I said, I don't try to rationalize what other people think. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lost cause. I would drive myself nuts trying to do that because I don't know what's going through his head. Is he worrying about his family more than himself? I've tried talking to Mark after he got out. Uh, I wrote Mark one time. He never replied. But he went to the back roads to my house. And he dropped me off, you know, close to my gate. Here's the problem, and this is the thing about Texas law. There's what's called the law of parties. Mm -hmm. Now, I was indicted as the primary shooter. I was tried as the primary shooter. I held all these people that had guns hostage. You know, I forced them all to do everything. Everybody's got a gun but the person testifying. Everybody's in fear for their life. What would have been your, your uh, motive? What does the prosecutor say about your motive? Well, Why they said you... it was for the car to go see the girl. But oh, that right. Was... That was, yeah, that was the first one, right? Right, yeah. right. That's, they said that and then needed another car. But throughout the interview process, my co-defendant, one of them eventually said something about um, the car being taken, right? Mm -hmm. And so the police just kind of latched onto that because that makes it capital murder. So you can kill somebody and walk away, and it's not death penalty. That's not cap capital murder. Right, it's not capital murder. You can kill somebody, walk away, come back, and take their shoes. It's not capital murder. No. But if you kill somebody for their shoes, yes. it's capital murder. So they had to prove this theme that I killed the people for the car, to take the car, and they wanted to prove a continuous episode because of the second murder. They wanted to figure out a way to tie them together. So the only thing they could come up with was that both cars were taken to go see... The uh, girl. Excuse me, the girl in Midland, right? And... Of course, nobody ever brought up the fact about me having a car. And <laughs> I walked up to the truck. Clint was sitting in the truck with the guy. He, the dude said he was going to give us a ride. This is Petri. Yes, ma'am. Supposedly, he had family in Midland, been meaning to go out there anyway. Did you know him, Petri? Never seen him. Never seen him. We just got gas. Mm. We just got gas. I'm not going to pay for ten dollars worth of gas if I'm going to kidnap somebody 15 feet away and carjack him and abandon his car. That don't make no sense. I'm saying, hey, well, I'm going to pull up here and go get some cigarettes, something to drink. So I go into the Brookshire's. I come out. This dude's sitting in the car in the truck. And I'm like, what's going on? And so he's like, it's, it's cool, man. I got this. So I'm like, hey, man, we need to talk, right? So I get into the car and I drive off, right? And he follows me. We end up later on. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, we need to get rid of Doyle's car. I said, OK, but what's up with this dude? He said, well, man, you know, he's just giving us a ride. And he kind of grinned. Now, I never heard him threaten Samuel Patrick. And I never seen him threaten Samuel Patrick. Again, I was inside the Brookshires, which the police never went there and interviewed anybody conveniently. They never talked to the, as a matter of fact, in the evidence, 
you see the photos of Brookshire's parking lot, mm -hmm. there's a sub gas station, a small gas station. You know, here in the United States, I'm sure you've seen these big yes. shopping centers. They got little gas stations yes. in the parking lot. Yes. There's one like that at the Brookshire's. There's a little gas station right there. They never talk to that clerk. Why? I don't know. I mean, the police never, they've ever investigated the crime scene. They just, I mean, <laughs> David Pace told them what happened and that's, they just drove by like three weeks later and took pictures of the parking lot. Three weeks was, later. That's three weeks, that's all they did. There's no police report, there's nothing. They never investigated that, they never talked to a store clerk, they never issued a media release, asking if anybody's seen any witnesses. David Page told them I kidnapped them, and that's all they ran with. They never did an independent investigation at all. We get out to Midland, clean. Uh, calls Amber. While you were there? Yeah, we're all in the truck. Uh, Amber's like, oh, the cops are looking for you. She told Clint. Yeah. Well, cops had already contacted their family, letting them know about Doyle. So we stop out by where it's called a pump jack, the oil fields, things that pump up and down, yeah. pump the oil out of the ground. Uh, while me and Sam are talking, Clint's walking back and forth on the edge of the truck. It's like, say, that's the truck. Clint's walking back and forth right here. Me and Sam are right here. About that time, you hear, sorry, Sam, you got to die. Shot him twice. And where was, where was uh, Clint standing at that point? Like I said, if, if that's the truck, I'm standing here, Sam's standing here. What's the here. front and what's the back? This is the front up here. Mm -hmm. Clint walks back and forth this way, mumbling, and yeah. all of a sudden he walks over and says, sorry, Sam, you got to die, and shoots him. Why would he? Said he knew too much. Too much of what? Once again, he never said anything. But why would he kill him if, if you, you were going to middle it anyway? He didn't, need, he didn't need to, right? I have no idea. From what I understand, Clint had been up for about three or four days. Some people can handle being up for days on end, some people can't. By the time I'm to the second murder, I've went to sleep. And the gunshots woke me up. Well, I jumped out of the truck, and I seen there was only one person standing there, David Page. Well, I asked him why he shoot him, and he said he knew my name. He knew Page's name? Right, right. And what it was, I had talked to my ex's father, mm -hmm. and he said the, the Texas Rangers are looking for David Page. And I turned around. I didn't know the conversation that David Page had while I was asleep. And he'd been telling this dude his whole life story. So I said, hey, they say the Texas Rangers are looking for you for murder. Because see, at first they weren't even looking for me. They was looking for him for the murder of Duel, the first victim. And I said, hey, dude, they're looking for you for murder. Well, right away, his eyes cut back there. And so I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have said that, you know? And, but like I said, even then, I didn't know what all they talked about. And then come to find out afterwards, he told him he was from Orr City, Texas, and he done told this dude his whole life story, right? But he said he was sleeping. Well, what do you think about that? That's a lie. He hadn't been sleeping? No. Not at all? You can act. You can ask Mark. You can ask. Mark Darn. wasn't there, right? No, I mean this before. Mm -hmm. He's sleeping. He's lying. And did you use any drugs during the whole ordeal? That 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 little bit. A little bit of what? It's. I used to do a, a lot, and I slowed down a lot. said uh, Clint's case is kind of typical. What made yes. it typical for you? Well, because he was a young kid um, who 
grew up without his father, um, was poor, and you know, I guess what's not normal is that he was Caucasian, because typically it's minorities that sort of have the same type of case. Um, but um, you know, he couldn't afford to hire an attorney. He had a court-appointed attorney. Um, and lots of times that's what happens um, with court-appointed attorneys on death penalty cases. It's just typical that they either are not experienced in that area of law or they're not experienced trying death penalty cases. Um, either way, the, the outcome is usually bad for the defendant because um, justice doesn't take place. How did you know about a deal? About what? You said I knew he had a deal, but how did you know? Because he was uh, telling people, you know what I'm saying? Like he got like, he didn't, I think he said like 40 or 30 years of you know, plea agreement, you know what I'm saying, to testify against Clinton. You know? But but who, who did he have to deal with? Uh, the DA, I believe. But, but, but he told you that? Yes, ma'am. One on one? Yes, ma'am. They brought him to the courthouse and they took all the, like I said, the handcuffs off of him and he's in street clothes. And they just leave him with his attorney and walk off. Now he's under indictment for capital murder. It's either life or death penalty. That's the only two options you got. So this is the most serious crime in the United States, basically. And a really strange situation, I and can't just, imagine. And they go in there and they talk to an investigator and they all decide they're gonna go to lunch. So they walk out the courthouse across the street to a cafe with all these civilians. He's got no handcuffs on. Yeah, David Page. It was 2010. Mm -hmm. Well, he come in there, and at first we didn't know what he was in there for. Then he was like, I'm in here, I got 30 years for uh, murder. And he, he, then he went on telling us about his case. drove, who shot who. He, he was saying a lot of stuff that he shouldn't have been saying. Like what? Um, where they hid, where they, where he hid the gloves, something about he took them in his truck and took them somewhere else. How they were at a pump jack and he shot that dude in the head. Uh, he is David. David, yes, yeah, David Page, my bad, I'll, I'll, I'll verify. Uh, David Page says something about how his lawyer paid off the district attorney and they made a deal, a plea agreement, that if uh, David Page testified, he'd get 30 years and that Clint, Clint Young would get the death penalty. Like, 30 years for David Page? That's the least amount I've ever seen anybody get for murder, ever. Usually it's 80, 90, 75. I've never seen nobody just get 30 years. And you actually overheard him saying that he made a deal? They, oh yeah, he told me. He said his lawyer made a deal with the t district attorney that if he testified that they, they would guarantee him that he wouldn't get no more than 30 years and that he would be out in 15. I, he said that. Did it shock you when you heard it? Oh yeah, 
when I heard that he got 30 years, I was like, what the? And Midland? He was like, yeah, they gave me 30 years. So, so I did testify, and I really feel like a piece of shit, and I'm really s sorry for what I've done. And he tried to sound like he was remorseful or whatever, but. Did you buy it? No. No. He would have done it again in a heartbeat. Guaranteed. He was like, my lawyers are gonna come get a statement from you and they're gonna come talk to you. I was like, all right, that's cool. And they were about to talk to you, uh, they were supposed to talk to you about what you've heard. Yes, and yes, you were, yes. And you were willing to testify. Yes, ma'am. But uh, they pulled me out of my cell one day. They're like, Kemp, come in here. Uh, someone wants to talk to you. So I'm automatically, I'm thinking it's Clint's lawyers. Well, then uh, they take me in this room and there's these two dudes. And me, I'm a very observant person. Like, just because of the drugs I've done, I, I observe every detail. Well, out of nowhere, I see this voice recorder in one of these dudes' hands. I'm like, voice recorder, hmm. First, you have to ask me if you can record any conversation. I know I got that right. I might be locked up, but I'm still a citizen. I, I got rights. Well, I asked him, I said, who are y'all with? They was like, well, that's not important. It's not important who we're with, we just need to know what you know about this Clint Young case. And I said, hold on, first off, I don't know who you are. You got a voice recorder right there recording everything I'm saying and ain't asked me nothing. Ain't, ain't told me my rights, ain't read me my Miranda rights, ain't told me nothing, ain't asked me if I need a lawyer. I, so then they, they were pissed. They were all red in the face, like, oh my God, this dude knows what's going on. How did you feel? <clears throat> disrespected, like, like mistreated, like I was just some piece of crap, you know what I mean? So, well then, right then they canceled the interview, took me back to my cell, and for some reason they wouldn't let Clint's lawyers come talk to me. I didn't get to talk to Clint's lawyers. But they were there, right? Yeah, they were there. Yeah. They were there they at were the They were trying, yeah, and, and they were trying oh, to reach Oh yeah, you. they were trying to see me. They would not let them see me though, for some reason, I don't know why. No, I didn't say everything in court. No. Why not? Because I was, uh, for one, they had, they had me. Uh, I had a burglar of a building, and then they tried to give me a first degree, engaging in an organized crime with the intent to escape. What could have been your sentence if, if you would have testified? Uh, in, in five to ninety nine. Five to ninety nine years. Yeah. So that's what you were facing. Yeah. But. I was scared to say it all in court, and I apologized to Clint afterwards. I was like, man, I'm sorry, but I got kids out there waiting for me to get out, man. I, I can't justify my freedom. I understand you're in this situation, and you're not guilty. All the way guilty. I mean, you, you were still there when all this stuff happened, but he definitely don't deserve to be on death row. I know that. He, he, uh... It's, it's messed up what they done to him. How sure are you that he's not the shooter? How sure? I mean, the dude, David Page, told 100%. David Page told me he was wearing gloves. He hit him in his truck. That's why he didn't have no gunpowder, gun residue on his hands. He told me all sorts. He said a bunch of stuff he shouldn't have said. Hell, where they did it, at a pump jack on a lease road. I mean, he told, he told us everything. And how come that so many people say that you admitted the crime? How does that work? Well, it's a lie. And it's also a lie that you have said that they were not going to connect you to the murder because you were wearing gloves? Even if I was wearing gloves, which I did have gloves, you could pull your shirt up over the sleeve of your shirt. Mm -hmm. I can hand you my ID holder. There's still going to be the fibers from you. Your shirt are going to get caught in here. Everything in this world has a signature. 
you're gonna, you could take, swab this, take it out there, have them check your shirt by your, by you leaning your arm on, until you've touched that. Yeah, but it's different if you wear gloves and it's, a, and fibers it, it connects you to a gun, right? Fibers from the gloves will be on the gun. The metallic signature from the gun will be on the gloves. If the gun had been fired, there's already powder residue on the glove, I mean, on the gun. If I fire a gun and hand it to you, you're gonna have powder residue on your hand. You may not have powder burns from the firing of the weapon, but you're still gonna have residue. But were you wearing gloves that night? I had bought some, yes. Why? Because it was cold. It was 11 degrees. Hmm? It was 11 degrees or 11 Celsius. It was cold. It was, there wasn't no 11 degrees of it. I, we were all wearing jackets. Mm hmm So, <laughs> if you're wearing, wearing jackets, it's kind of cold. You really can't tell, but I've got messed up hand here. That's the right there from fighting. I've got poor blood flow due to cut myself right there whenever I was younger. Uh, messed up this hand whenever I was a little kid. My hands get cold. My hands are cold right now. And I'm, I've had them like this almost the whole time, except for the time I'm using them. So. So you needed them because you were yes, cold. So you, you never said that you shot Sam Petri no, through the never, head twice. Never. And that they will never connect you to the murder. That's just said, untrue. Whenever they asked me about it, I said, there's no way they can connect me to it due to the fact that the where, where I was standing, where Clint was standing, and where, I mean, where uh, Sam Petri was standing. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the, the bullets, they came from the wrong area. They can't place the gun in my hand with or without gloves on. But where are those gloves now? In the state's custody. They just never, they try to destroy them. Mm -hmm. So I said, look, I didn't kill that old man. You, know, you take my DNA, take my blood, take my hair samples, test them gloves. I didn't kill that dude. And they didn't know what gloves I was talking about. So we sat there and argued about the gloves. Finally, they go back out to the crime scene and found them. They left them out there. But when they sent the gloves to be tested, they asked for DNA testing on the outside of the gloves. And all these years, I was thinking, why would they do that? And it finally made sense to me. Because DNA testing, they have to cut the material. Mm -hmm. And I told them that there would be gunshot residue on the outside of the glove. So by cutting the material, they was destroying the outside of the gloves. And it was all cut up. The only thing that saved me was instead of going straight to the DNA expert, the gloves went to the ballistic expert mm -hmm. who was matching the weapon, matching up the weapons. And he on his own just happened to spray and look underneath the light and seen the residue right there, mm -hmm. which is the pattern from the blowback from a gun if somebody fired a gun. But he couldn't do no further testing because it wasn't requested. But by him doing that and creating a, a report about it, the DNA expert couldn't test that part of the gloves. So that's the only thing, was this guy just on his own, just happened out of curiosity to do it, save the gloves. What did you think after you helped the DA? Oh, I figured they'd kind of help me. I figured they would give me a, a life sentence where I found the third party in the criminal negligence. I'm like, all right, cool. Third party covers two to 10, maximum 10 years, minimum two. Third party was a state jail felony. That's two years, day for day, that you have to do. So that's 12? That's 12 years. Mm -hmm. So I told my lawyer, hey, look, give me 15, and I'll sign. Why would you ask 15 if you could get away with 12? Because I had a better chance, I think I had a better chance at 15 than I, I did 12. So they offered you a plea deal? Yes, ma'am. For how many years? I think it was either like 60 or 65. 60 or 65. 60. And how did that feel to you? I'm like, for what? I, I came, I told y'all what I knew about both murders. So first they offered you 60? Yes, ma'am. And then they, at one point, offered you 30, right? Yes, ma'am. It didn't feel right? No, it didn't feel right at all. Because you've helped them, right? I figured, I, I, you help me, I help you. Mm-hmm. 
And in what other ways did you help the DA? It's, like I said, I, I told them exactly who, who killed Doyle. In my opinion, Mark is the one that killed Doyle. So Clint's not the one who killed Doyle? If anything, that's aggravated assault with a deadly weapon or attempted murder. Clint's not the one that killed Doyle. Yeah, Clint fired the first two shots, he mobilized him, but he's not the one that killed him. So that should be on Mark's It account. should be, in my, in my opinion. But what I understand is by Clint, I mean by Mark, playing out for the 15 for non-aggravated kidnapping, they threw out the murder or capital murder, whatever it was he was, and by doing that, he can never be charged with it again. Well, they don't, they go arrest my, Mark Ray, another co-defendant, <laughs> and when he's in the jail, they charge him with murder, okay? This is where the, the criminality of the state's actions come in because they're bound by Supreme Court law. I mean, the, it's the law of the land. If you make a plea bargain, you have to inform the defense. When I go into that trial, I'm allowed to know everything that's going on. My lawyers had a hearing before the trial and put the district attorneys on the stand under oath and asked them, has there been any talks of plea bargains? And they said no. They all said no. Okay, well we got that report, the new attorneys I did, they get the, the lawyer's personal file mm -hmm. and that's how they got this report. And so they go get the attorney's billing records that he's filed with the courthouse to get his money. Mm -hmm. and on, Almost every line is met with district attorney and client to discuss plea bargain. Met with district attorney, it's like five lines. I differ conclude the video at 328 on the 27th of November 2001. Is it true that the investigator he told you that he thinks that you you are the killer in the second case? Yes. And what did you respond to him when he said that? The same scenario. And what did he say about that scenario of yours? He never shot it down, but he just kept saying, I still think you're the one that did it. I think you're the one that did it. The DA had never had a death penalty case. And here comes this horrible case. You know, and there's me not saying nothing. And so you got one side of the story, and that's the co-defendants. It's just, it was like the perfect storm for him. And he went all out. And they had this big elaborate trial like it's never been had in Texas before. He just rolled his dice. And after my, the state upheld my conviction, the appeals court upheld my conviction, he retired. The only reason I can think of and forgive me if this is too um, short-sighted, but the only thing I could think of is that they offered you the deal because you were the killer and they wanted to close the, the case. They wanted to have this capital murder. You're wrong. So that didn't happen? No, ma'am. And how would you feel if he would actually have been executed? What, the, what would it do to you or to your soul or to your... There's a, there's a saying that my religion has, and it's pretty much the only rule we have to follow. And ye harm none, do what you will. I can do what I want as long as I'm not hurting anyone. You never hurt anyone. I can't say that. But since I picked up this religion, I've done my best not to. And when did you pick up this religion? 2006. So after the... Yes, ma'am.